Hi everybody. So today we're going to be reading just the introduction of an original book of Squires and Knights. And we're going to be looking at chapter one. So let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 1 Deeds of Knights and Squires Another sword at your throat, Squire Jonathan? It was a familiar dare, and Jonathan's challenger wore a huge grin. Jonathan himself made no move at the moment. He looked at his friend standing just a few feet away, his black hair blowing back in the wind, and the tip of his sword was inches from Jonathan's throat. However, the swords they clutched so strongly were made merely of wood. Jonathan closed his glove tighter on his practice sword. He leaned back and deflected his friend's blow so that his sword flew out of his bare hand and through the air. Jonathan drove his wooden sword toward the other squire's belly, then stepped back at the last moment. Death hit, Jonathan said, ending the practice game. Oh, fie, said Jonathan's friend, Bernie. He extended his hand to Jonathan, who flashed a modest smile. Bernie continued, Good match, my friend. Jonathan laughed. You should have gone straight across my neck if you wanted to kill me. Even while jesting, his eyes held a certain insight within, though he was merely of twenty years. Like many squires, he wore mostly dark clothing other than his white tunic, with a jerkin wrapped closed by a leather belt. Beaming, Bernie pointed his mock sword upward. It was full-sized, made especially for the squires to help hone their skills, and was crafted to be nearly as heavy as a steel blade. Bernie brushed its blunt tip with his hand. Kill you? he asked. With this? They crossed the wooden swords, tapping them in their usual gesture after having a friendly mock sword fight, one of many. As squires of Consigny, they practiced daily the various disciplines that would prepare them to become knights, sword fights, practicing for jousts, and so on. Yet, they were also ready for actual deadly defense, if needed. Their sword belts which held both a real sword and dagger, lying on the ground nearby. They stepped through the forest clearing where they practiced, the grasses opening out to meet a splendid wood in the east. Here they dropped their faux weapons and donned their real sword belts once again, sitting down by one of the trees. Two horses stood on the edge of the forest, wearing brown leather saddles and bridles, both tied to the lower branches of a couple trees. The brown morgan chewed daintily on the grass, while the white stallion tilted its head, its big dark eyes gazing around curiously. The evergreens behind them grew to a thick diameter, towering until they obscured the sky. Bernie turned to the horses. Do not eat too much over there, he joked, his long hair falling over his perpetually smiling face. Wait a moment, Jonathan said. 
He ran his hand through the brown hair framing his face. I hope we didn't stay out here too long. Sir Ansel wanted you to make another delivery today. Oh, said Bernie, sighing. I do not think he wants me to today any more. Are you still thinking you should not be delivering those bags? asked Jonathan. You have been doing it for almost a month now. I know, said Bernie. I do not mind going to the apothecary shop, but it makes me feel like a page again. I meant to ask you, said Jonathan. I know anyone would want to serve any knight besides Rancel, but would you want to find a way to train under someone else, if the king would allow it? If there were only a way, my friend, Bernie said, a bit mischievous. You are lucky. Sir Grant is great to you. I would not mind being his squire, though I'm not really complaining, you see. I figure when I'm knighted it will be over, and I will never see the bloody fool again. Jonathan then sighed wearily. Sir Grant's going to practice with me at the Quintain tomorrow. I hope I do better than last time. All at once, the bright sky and warm air started to fade. The sun seemed to fade as well as it began to set. Jonathan's white stallion began neighing. It bobbed its head up and down, staring warily into the forest. Jonathan stood and drew his sword. What is it, Galance? he asked. He began to advance toward the forest. Bernie drawing his sword in turn behind. A deep voice then resounded behind the cover of the trees. Are those swords I hear being drawn? Bernie laughed and replaced his sword in its sheath. Jonathan lowered his sword but still gripped it. A large, tall man popped out between the trees, appearing rather as a mobile weapon center. He harbored a sword and dagger on his belt, as well as a pack of arrows slung diagonally across his body, and held a large bow nearly half his height. His long, dark hair was pulled back, and his small eyes peered at Jonathan, perplexed. Put your sword away, lad, he commanded. You do not need it in the company of friends. Jonathan returned his gaze for a moment, then put his sword back in its sheath, though his hand wanted to fight the action, as he hardly considered this pompous man a friend. Bernie, however, smiled and approached his knight. Hello, sir he said. We did not hear your horse. I would have recognized his steps. We were just practicing the sword fight. He went over to his wooden sword in the grass, picking it up in display. I see, said Sir Rensel. He turned to Jonathan. Has he improved, or does he still have the same weak grip as always? Jonathan fought to keep a neutral rather than resentful expression. He seems strong to me. Yes, said Bernie, grinning as ever, even in the face of his condescending mentor. It has been months since you and I have practiced together, though I am sure you still have much to teach me. Sir Rancel shot an irritated glance at Bernie. Do not complain about my inability to further instruct you, boy, he said. I will deal with you when I have the time. Oh, yes, sir, said Bernie. Thank you, sir. I have, for your feeble enlightenment, been hunting all day. 
Rancel tugged at the quiver of arrows hanging at his side. We shot four deer in one day. Again, I have provided plenty of food for the castle. And, oddly, the arrogant Sir Rancel dared to interrupt himself and gazed at the ground, a cruel gleam in his eye. What is this? he asked. There on the ground scampered a white bird that was somehow injured. It scurried helplessly on the grass, its tiny feet unable to tread the unsteady ground, holding its wing out to the side as if broken. Disliking the cunning in Rancel's eye, Jonathan desired to draw his sword and deflect whatever evil Rancel wished to do. However, Rancel moved quickly, bending down to scoop up the bird like a handful of fruit. The bird shook, trapped in his large hands, yet without use of its wings, it had no escape. Rancel grinned, putting his face up to the bird so that it jumped to the edge of his hand. "'You shall make a splendid gift for the king, yes?' he said. He lifted the bird toward the setting sun. "'A splendid gift,' he turned to Bernie. "'I must return to my horse. I shall see you at supper, boy,' he said. Rancel then spun around and disappeared back into the forest. "'What is his obsession with bringing wounded animals to the king?' asked Jonathan. "'It was a baby stoat last time, if I remember.' A faint bell clanged, then muted, as if it made its way for many miles, barely audible as it reached the clearing." The supper bell, Bernie cried. Jonathan moved to pick his practice sword up from the grass. Better get back to the castle, he said. He walked over to Gallant's, holding the wooden sword in one hand and petting his steed's head with the other. Hey, boy, he said. Ready to go back? It will be time for your supper soon, too. Starting the ride back, both squires grasped their wood swords with one hand and steered their steeds with the other. Jonathan smoothly maneuvered gallants in front, and they rode along the lush clearing. The late day sun blended with the rose-orange tones in the sky, the force edge bordering their ride. Bernie's voice came to Jonathan from behind. I know you are excited about the tournaments in a few days, he said, sarcasm tainting his voice. Jonathan chuckled and shook his head. He despised tournaments, seeing them only as a way for arrogant knights to show off. His mentor knight, Sir Grant, practiced little for tournaments, relying only on the skill he already possessed to get him through. For a tournament was merely a competition, an excuse for the king to show off his knights and their strength to the commoners, in order for them to keep their allegiance so they could provide foot soldiers when war loomed at the castle gate. Sir Rancel loves them, you know, said Bernie. I believe you, Jonathan said with a slight laugh. He eyed the castle, which seemed to glide closer as they rode. At the moment, it was still only a gray blob, a shadow sitting atop a squat hill and merging with the sky. It looked like they would take an eternity to reach it. However, Jonathan knew that if they kept their horses at a steady canter, they would reach the castle in time for supper. Finally, the forest alongside them disappeared, leaving only a huge field of grass blowing sideways in the wind. 
It did not take long for them to reach their home, Consigny Castle. The castle stood in splendor as the fading sun illuminated it. Jonathan had lived in the castle for so long, nearing fourteen years since his arrival as a page at seven years old, that the stone fortress was an image etched in Jonathan's mind that could never fade away. Constructed of gray stone, dense enough to weather any storm, flood, or seemingly any natural disaster, the castle towered over the humble clearing where it was built. Its four rising towers stretched up toward the sunset at the north, south, east, and west corners of the castle. It stood resilient as the day it was built, though small chips had been chiseled away by many years, just as the years had chipped away at Jonathan, Bernie, and all the others who lived within the celebrated fortress. Two stories full of chambers were built safe within, such as the great hall, the throne room, the king's chamber, and the chambers of the resident knights living in and protecting the castle at all times. Atop the outer walls stretched long tracks of battlements. At the front stood the gridiron gate, closed with two armed guards standing behind it. A moat circled the castle, its waters old and grubby, but it served its purpose of protecting the castle from any potential intruder craving to dig beneath the castle walls and pop up some place in the courtyard. At the moment, the drawbridge was lowering down across the moat. The guards beyond the gate had a relaxed grip on their axes, which were just about as tall as the guards themselves. On the other side of the moat, Sir Rensel and the King of Consigny walked into the gatehouse, Jonathan seen the back of His Majesty's indigo robes trailing behind him, a golden vest reaching down to the ground, matching his modest but bejeweled crown. Jonathan and Bernie's horses galloped up to the drawbridge as it landed on the bank of the moat to welcome them back home. Thank you for listening to this chapter of Of Squires and Knights.